um, our team specialised in computer forensic investigations. This is all we do. We investigate various incidents using our computer forensic tools and techniques. I'm also a SANS instructor, which means I have the great benefit of being able to teach other people the various methods and tools and, and the way in which we do what we do. And that's what this very good presentation is all about. What I've done is I've taken some of the highlights from the SANS computer forensic curriculum and I've thrown them into a few slides over 20 minutes. And I'm going to go through them with you today to give you a little bit of a taste of, again, what are the kinds of artifacts that we look for on a computer when we're investigating a case. And it can be anything from a criminal matter, a fraud, an internal investigation, a company, theft of IP, data breach, system intrusion. All of these methods can apply equally well to these cases. So, without further ado, let's get stuck into it. So this is a bit, of a, a bit of a collection of different artifacts and techniques. The first one I'm going to go through is pretty familiar to most of you, shortcut files or link files. Now you may be familiar with the concept that on a Windows box you can create a shortcut to a file, to a folder, to a network location. And, but the, the mechanism of a shortcut or a link file is actually something that the Windows operating system uses quite extensively to, to make it more user friendly, to make it easier for you to find things that you've been at before. So you probably know too that your programs folder, all the programs you have and the various uh, subfolders in there, are nothing more than a collection of shortcut files. And by examining those as a forensic examiner, you can look at things like when were they installed, when was the shortcut created, when was it last accessed, maybe that might indicate when the program was last used. <coughs> your recent folder in the start menu, your recent folder, is also simply a collection of link files or shortcut files. And while it might only contain sort of 10 or so documents, so you might go into your recent folders and you'll see sort of 10 or so documents there. Behind the scenes, those are stored in the directory in the file system, in the recent directory. And rather than just having the 10 or so that appear in the menu, you can actually have you know, well over 100 link files showing you different folders and locations where that user is accessed. And each of those can provide valuable information about the document. So for example, if we take those shortcut files and we parse them with some forensic tools, we can get information such as obviously the file that was accessed, the path it was accessed from, whether that path was local, whether it was a removable drive like a USB device, whether it was a network path. So you can use this to reconstruct people looking at certain network directories and sensitive information. It'll also tell you a range of timestamps. So the shortcut file, because it's a file, it has a set of timestamps itself on the file system. For example, when the user accessed that document for the first time, it correlates usually to the creation time of the shortcut. When they last accessed the document, it usually correlates to the last access time on the shortcut file as well. Embedded in the shortcut file are a set of additional timestamps which relate to the actual target of the shortcut points to. So you've got a situation where someone accessed a sensitive document. You can not only tell when they did it, but you can actually get the metadata the timestamps of the document itself. If it's a removable device, you can also get things like the volume name and even the volume serial number of that device. And all this is coming out of a shortcut file. So think about it for a second. If you've got a case where someone has a sensitive document on a USB key and they open up that document and the shortcut file is created, that shortcut can tell you identifying details of the USB key, the volume name, the serial number, and it can also give you all the information about the document that was accessed. All of that can be done without the USB key and without the document through one file, one shortcut file. It's a pretty powerful artifact. And if you think about how many of these are sitting on a local system, on a Windows system, there can be easily well over 100 if you think of the live shortcut files and the ones we can recover through, through recovery and things. So, very simple. Quite obvious, most people think that you know they're familiar with shortcut, but when you really dig into it, there's a lot of information there. And this is a good example of what we do as forensic examiners is we find really what we do, we find these breadcrumbs, these little bits of information that exist on a computer. We know where to look for them, we know how to recover them, how to analyze them, how to use them to reconstruct what was happening at a certain point in time, which is essentially what forensics is all about. So let me move on. What Microsoft did with Windows Vista, Windows 7, is they extended this notion of a shortcut, this sort of user friendliness, and they created a thing called a jump list. And you're probably familiar with this when you have a uh, you know, Windows 7 system. When you have your program icon down the bottom in the taskbar there, excuse me, um, if you sort of hover over that, all the menus pop up, and the menus have lists of documents that were accessed through that program. 
or if it's a web browser, it might have a list of websites that were visited, or if it's a program such as WinZip, it might have certain custom functions like create a zip file, open a zip file, that kind of stuff. All of that information is stored on the computer. And again, as a forensic examiner, you look at these kinds of user-friendly features in Windows and you go, hmm, hang on a minute. If that exists, that means that that information has been recorded somewhere. Where's it being recorded? How can we use it? That information is recorded in, it's buried deep in the, uh, in the user profile. This is a directory called automatic destinations. And this exists, if you've got a Windows system, you can open it up and you can browse into this directory and you'll have these files on your file system. Each of those files is a junk list that relates to a program. Now the first thing you might think is, wow, there's a lot there. There's a lot more there than I have icons on my taskbar. How come there are so many? It turns out that even if you don't pin a program to your taskbar, Windows is still recording information about documents you access. It's still populating this junk list data, and it's all being stored behind the scenes. Which also makes it difficult for someone who tries to cover their tracks. So similarly, when we talk about shortcuts, occasionally you get a user who thinks, well, I've looked at this document, but I don't want anyone to know I've looked at it, so I'll just go and delete my recent you know, my link file. Problem is, how do you know you've got everything? Because if you delete the link file, it's not going to delete the reference to the jump list. So there's multiple places. Whenever you interact with a computer, there's usually multiple places where the activity is being recorded. And again, as forensic examiners, what we do is we know where that information is. We know how to get it, how to tear it apart and analyze it and use it to investigate whatever we're investigating. So the next question is, okay, well, we know these jump lists exist as files, but what can we do with that? Can we look into that and see what they contain? And you probably guess the answer is yes. So if we take a jump list that relates to, say, Microsoft PowerPoint, and we open it up, what you'll see, if we, we're using a program called Structured Storage Viewer, we've opened up the jump list, and each of the entries in that jump list is stored essentially as a stream, and it, it essentially is a link file itself. So what a jump list is, it's like a whole bunch of link files all squashed together into one file or concatenated in. And because we know that, we know that data structure, we can pull them out. And when we pull them out, all we do is we essentially pull them out as a series of link files. And as we said before, there's a lot of information we can get from the link file, and here's how we get it. So again, it's another great place to find information about documents that were accessed, applications that were used, things you can do to reconstruct what a person was doing on the computer. So talk a bit about documents. What about execution, program execution? If you're doing, say, malware case, and you want to identify suspicious programs that were accessed, or perhaps you've got a file, and you want to see uh, what it executed, what it was associated with. Windows has a, a piece of functionality called prefetch. What prefetch does, or superfetch, is it preloads information into memory to enable the program to run more quickly. Now again, because Windows is storing this information, as forensic examiners, we can go and retrieve that and use it to help our analysis. There's a file, uh, sorry, a folder on your computer, you can open that up, it's in C Windows prefetch directory, and it contains a series of .pf files, each of those is a prefetch, and each of those relates to execution of a program. And embedded in that prefetch file, when you parse it out with the prefetch analysis tool, you can get information about the programs that were run, when they were first run, when they were last run, uh, the number of times they were run, and not only that, you can also get information about files and folders, and also devices that were used in the execution of that program. So for example, if you've got a suspicious executable on your computer, you can find the prefetch file, open it up, see what else it's touching on that computer. Or by contrast, if you identify that there's a text file on your computer that's associated with a keylogger, you can say, well, what executable actually dropped this file? And say you don't have a memory image and you need to go back to the file system, this might be one place where you might find that evidence. And the great thing about prefetch files is it not only stores information about executables from the GUI, but also from the command line. So it's a pretty powerful place to, to gather information. You can see down the bottom of the screenshot, we've got the WinZip program, and you can see the next, uh, the next column has information about the folders and the devices that were accessed, and the final column actually has the individual files that were used through WinZip. So pretty powerful piece of information if you're trying to reconstruct something like an Ali case. Timelining. Timelining is a relatively new technique in computer forensics, but it is an incredibly powerful technique. It's actually built on a tool called Logs and Timeline, which was written by a, a great examiner called Christian Jorgensen, who was actually a SAM student in a course when he had this idea, and he was talking to Rob Lee, who's sort of the, the fellow that oversees computer forensics at SAM, 
and they came up with this idea of creating a tool. What the way timelining basically works is on a computer, as artifacts are being created and stored, there's timestamps. And there's timestamps all over the place on the computer. There's timestamps in Word documents, there's timestamps in prefetch files that were stored before, there's timestamps on the file system, system logs, and internet activity, and internet, all over the place. So what Christian did is he wrote a tool that basically goes across the computer and pulls out timestamps from all these different places and then constructs them into a chronology. And by looking at that chronology, you can get not a perfect, but a very, very good representation of what was happening on a computer at previous points in time. So if you take an example where you've got a file, secret file, it's got lock X, sounds suspicious, and the file sits on the file system, and you probably know that the file system stores various files in your file. So it's got a timestamp for when the file was created, when it was last accessed, when it was last modified. There's actually on an NTFS file system, there's eight timestamps stored, a minimum of eight, in fact, for every file. So there's a lot of temporal information there. So if you just look at the file system, you can get some basic stuff. When was it modified, when was it created, when was it attached, when was the recycler. But if you apply super timeline, what you can actually do is find other timestamps associated with that document in other places. So here we've pulled out some information, some creation details from the document metadata. We've got some information for from and where. We've got a registry key that shows execution of Microsoft Word and opening that file. We've got a link file, which we talked about before, again, corroborating that the user accessed the file from a certain location. And when you put all of this together, you can get an incredible context around the file. So instead of saying, here's a file, here's when it was created and last access, we now have all this great context about where did it come from, how did it get here, which users were involved, what did they do with it, and you can really do a great picture of what was going on. And, and again, forensics is really about context. Any, anyone can look at a file and say, here's when the file was last accessed. But what a good examiner can do is say, well, here's the context around what was happening, who did it, when did they do it, why did they do it, how did they do it. That kind of stuff is what really makes a strong investigation. A couple more, I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, USB devices. We talked a bit before about how link files store information for USB, like the volume name and the volume serial number. Turns out, every time you plug a USB device into a Windows machine, it stores information about that USB. And it's stored in different places. Some of it's in the registry, some of it is in um, uh, particular log files that Windows uses for driver configuration. But when you pull this information out, you can get information about the vendor of every USB device that's plugged into a Windows box, the make and the model, the physical serial number of it, the volume name, which you can correlate back to the link file details I've talked about before, when it was last used, when it was first connected, when it was first connected after the last reboot, the users that used it, and of course all that stuff that came out of the link file. So there's a tremendous amount of information that you can get about USB devices just by looking at the computer itself. And one of the most common cases we do is theft of intellectual property. So a company rings us up and says, we think that someone has taken our sensitive information, we want you to investigate it. One of the first bits of evidence that we have is the user's computer. And one of the things that we always look at is the use of removable devices because we can very quickly say to the company, here's a list of every removable device that we plug in, right down to the physical serial number. And that's a great leverage for that company because then they can use that to maybe go to the person and say, our forensic examiners have told us that these are all the USB devices, can you please have those so that we can examine them? Which can be quite confronting if you're on the, on the receiving end of an investigation like that. So USB devices leave a lot of artifacts on the computer, which Again, it's a we can, we can recover and we can reconstruct. Wireless geolocation. Again, the, the more you look at Windows, the, the more you realise how much information it stores about your usage. One of the really interesting things that it does is every time you connect to a wireless network or any kind of network, it stores the information about that network, right down to things like the SSID, what kind of network it is, whether it's broadband, whether it's wired, whether it's wireless the timestamps associated with your connection, and even the MAC address of the access point. So if you're in a room here with a Windows computer and you're connected to an access point, the physical MAC address of that access point has been recorded in your Windows registry. We can recover that access point. Not only can you recover it, you can use it to geolocate. So there are various websites. Google.net is one that's been around for a long time. Where you can go to the website, you can put in the MAC address of an access point and it will try to locate, physically locate in the world that access point. Now, if you think about that from the perspective of recreating where a computer went, if you 
you've got on the computer a list of the wireless networks, the times that each of them were last connected to, and the physical MAC address, you can actually construct a chart that will show you how that computer is physically moved, and thereby how the user is potentially physically moved. So if you're doing a case where you need to locate someone, or physically put someone in a place at a certain point in time, all of that is definitely possible. Could you switch back to the... Yes. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm, I'm going to hang around after this. I'm more than happy to chat and um, answer questions for people, but I'll just pick that up a little bit. So that's all the artifacts I want to talk about. What have we found? Think about in 20 minutes, in the space of 20 minutes, the kinds of artifacts that we've shown you and the things we've been able to do. We can look at access to files, folders, removable devices. We can reconstruct what happened with removable devices in the computer. We can geolocate. 